to the light gate. Uh, tonight's going to be a really cool show, and I just wanted to open up by letting you know who we are and where we're coming from. It's the light gate. We're coming to you from the United Public Radio Network in the beautiful city of New Orleans at 107.7 and the United Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. We're on Roku, and I'm sorry that y'all can't see us, but we will endeavor to explain everything so you're not left out. And uh, we're on YouTube and Facebook and many other platforms. Uh, we hope you have a great show with us, and let's go. Okay, Preston. <laughs> Hi, Dolly. Thanks very much. I'm excited. We have a good guest tonight. How are you doing, Dolly? I'm good. Awesome. Yeah, me yep. too. I'm pretty excited. And uh, yeah, this is going to be our 10th episode. So we're hopefully getting the hang of it <laughs> a little bit better. But I see lots of people in chat. So I just want to say a quick hi to some of you. There's Doxy. You were here very early, time traveling from Australia. I love that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And here's Robert Allen Yaffe. Always good to see you here. And Love there's it. Tammy. Hi, Tammy. Wait. We won't make you wait too long. Sorry. Probably you've heard that a million times. So I apologize for that. Uh, but there's Ruth Kleber. Kleber? Kleber? I think it's Kleber. I'll go with that. You can correct me, Ruth, if I get that wrong. Um, hi, Don Curtis. Awesome to see you. Louise. I've seen you here before. So thank you for joining us. And Here's Janice Conant. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to see you all here. Tommy G, Nightgazer. Alex G says hello from Texas. Christopher Harmon. Really cool to see all you here. Great troll. I definitely recognize you and a real badger. Um, let's see who else do we got here? Chad Smith Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Debbie Majeski. Ah, Scuba Maru. I, I know you well, at least through YouTube. Uh, Delina, Terry D, Nightgazer. Oh, Nancy Thames. Hi, Nancy. Uh, there's a lot of you here. One R Wedding Golden Boy says hello from Poland. Oh, that's Ooh, cool. yeah. And here is Chris Space Team. <laughs> Raul, Jesse Melendez. Well, I could say hi to you guys all night long. So I am just going to dive into our show because we have a very exciting guest. This is something, someone that both Dolly and I know pretty well. She has her own podcast, which we've both been on. And I know she has a lot of really interesting experiences. And her name is Karen Holton. So she is, let me just read her bio here an experiencer, an exopolitical activist, an ascension coach, and more. She's actually done quite a few things, uh, really working very hard for the good of all humanity. She's part of the Forbidden Knowledge News Network. And as part of this, she hosts the weekly podcast, Quantum Guides Show. That's the show Dolly and I were on. And this show is aimed towards the newly awakened and for those who are awake, but maybe socially isolated by their alternative beliefs. I know what that's like. My family thought I was crazy when I started talking about UFOs and out-of-body experiences. <laughs> it was a bit isolating. I could have used Karen. Uh, Karen also hosts the new podcast, Aliens and Angels, which focuses on personal paranormal experiences. And Karen has spent more than a decade researching and educating the public about the nefarious global agendas here on Earth. And we all know that that's a real problem. But soon after, she did receive a spiritual download and as a result, created the Quantum Health Transformation Program to assist others to heal, evolve, and thrive. And this is actually available for free on her website. She has got a lot of stuff out there to help people. Karen, of course, has had many experiences with spiritual healing. I'd love to hear about that. Paranormal events, angelic encounters, and what I'm certainly most interested in are her ET encounters. And I've talked to her, to her about that, and I know they're very extensive. And in fact, Karen is cur currently writing a book about her ET experiences. She's also created many products and services and is working hard to assist those who are waking up during these critical times. 
She does have, you know, websites and all kinds of stuff. And we'll put those links in the show notes. But let's just bring Karen on because I know she has a lot to share today. There she Hi. is. <laughs> I miss Hi, Karen. you guys. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's actually cold here today and rainy, so I'm a little bit bundled up. But you never know. Uh, how's it been there? It's been hot. Ninety-two today and raining, so we're we're humid and sweltering. Yep. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, you're yeah. actually up in Canada, right? Pardon? You're up in Canada. Yeah, I'm in Alberta, Canada. Yeah. Wow. A. <laughs> I'm in Canada. Eh? <laughs> Very cool. Well, Canadians are known for being super polite. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I, try. I, I try. Know. I'll behave myself. <laughs> Good. Well, you can be naughty if you want. We'll allow it. <laughs> so, yeah, we do have a lot to talk about, and I'm not sure where to start because you've done and experienced so much. But I always like to start with childhood and the first glimmerings of the supernatural and ETs and how you kind of started on this pathway to what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. so, you know what I mean? I did, what was the first thing that sort of made you go, hmm, is this normal? <laughs> well, um, I was very young uh, when I started having paranormal experiences and I thought that they were normal and I thought everybody had them. I didn't know that they were paranormal experiences. I just always had, I would say the most common experience I had was knowing that I wasn't alone in the, in the room. I knew that there were other beings that were with me that I couldn't see. And, um, but I didn't know what to do about that. So I would go to my, my mom or, or family or whatever. And they would say, Oh, don't be talking like that. People are going to think you're crazy. You know, don't ever mention that to anybody. And so I sort of um, started to self-regulate very early. And then I got involved with churches and all the churches said the same thing. Oh, it's the work of the devil. And you're opening yourself up. You know, if you're going to open yourself up, then you're not welcome here. You know, you got to just, you know, be a hundred percent for God and this and that. And, um, and so I became actually afraid of my abilities and, and what I was perceiving as real. And it caused me to have a few problems, like it caused me to become very afraid of the dark, even as an adult. But it was um, in the... Oh, wait, 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 let's back up a little bit. What were some of these experiences as a kid? Well, okay, I'll just give you a couple. Um, <laughs> one, I had, I have, a, I had a brother four years older than me, and he was really a mean sob. And he used to like to lock me in the closet. And it was dark in there, and I couldn't see anything. But I could see the room outside of the closet uh, with my eyes closed. So, oh, wow. um, and it really helped a lot because I just waited, and I could see. You know, he's out there laughing and and stuff. So there was things like that. I also would get um, spontaneous knowings and also um, spontaneous communication. But like I said, very early on, I started to shut all that down. I also had a natural ability to communicate with animals and plants. And it didn't matter what I did. I was just the weirdest kid in the block. And it was it hurt me socially for sure. Uh, but, um, you know, and then I shut it down. So I would say I was about, I don't know, maybe grade four. So I'd be about 10 years old when I started going to churches and stuff. And then I really, they really, you know, I mean, nobody wants to piss God off. And basically they said, if you're going to talk like that and think like that, you know, um, God's not going to want anything to do with you. And it was always, the onus was always that there was something wrong with me, something wrong with me, you know? And so um, it was very liberating to quit religion. And, I, and no offense to anybody out there who's who's got a religious affiliation. If it's working for you, great. I'm happy for you. But for me, it really did me a lot of harm. And so, um, you know, just like a compressed spring after I uh, quit religion for good. And, and it doesn't mean I'm not spiritual. I totally believe in God. Heck, even the ETs believe in God. That's not a that's not a foreign concept. Uh, or a strange thing to believe in, but I just no longer would let humans tell me 
what God wanted from me. So that left room for me to find out directly what God wants for me. And then I had an angelic experience um, about the 1990s. I won't get into that. There's tons of podcasts with me talking about it, especially lately. Oh, Everyone has hear about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I just want to take up the whole show with it. Basically, I'll tell you, it was an extremely low point in my life. You really want to hear it? The yeah. first one. I want to hear the first one out the gate. <laughs> I only had one angelic experience. Okay. Wow. But it opened me up for everything else. So okay. uh, basically, um, my life was a mess. I was a hot mess, no doubt about it. Uh, I did everything wrong, and including marrying the wrong people and just did everything wrong. Uh, because I kept going ex for external advice, external experts. You know, I had no faith in my own ability. So um, at one point, I had been divorced from my husband. It's a little bit sad, but I'll try to keep it short. And um, uh, when I left religion, you know, I just sort of opened myself up to all, I started having all these psychic experiences, just basically spontaneous knowings, things I had no way of knowing, but I knew. Um, and um, my former husband said, well, I think it's time for your children. I had two children uh, with him to come and live with me and my, my new wife. It's our turn to have a, you know, a, a try at it. And uh, I thought, well, it can't hurt. And they promised not to not to keep the children from me. But as soon as the kids got moved down and it was quite a, you know, it was I was on Vancouver Island. They were on the mainland. It was, you know, a fair jaunt to go to get down there. And um, and then he kept them from me. And my mother, who was a I'll just tell you, I spent the last bit of religion. What really did it for me was I spent 17 years as a Jehovah Witness and my mother was a Jehovah Witness. So when I left, boy, was she livid. And so um, she also wanted to keep the children away from me. Uh, because I was just demonized. As far as everyone was concerned, I was either crazy or I was demonized. It was it was pretty pretty harsh. So I fell into a huge um, a huge uh, my my frequency. This is just how I look at it. Was very low. I was in grieving and mourning and confusion. And when you leave um, a religion like that, you're shunned. So everyone says you're dead to God. You're dead to us. So 17 years of community friendships, everything gone. And I was devastated. Uh, in, a, in retrospect, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because these, these experiences define us and help us to, to make huge shifts that might not be possible otherwise. But anyway, while I was living in this little place, um, I kept having the urge to want to kill myself and in a very specific way. And what's really strange about this is, I'm just going to jump ahead a bit. Two years later, I met a woman and she asked me where I lived and I told her and she said, oh my God, do you know what happened in that house? And I said, no. And she told me that she was friends with, um, uh, with the mother of a man who lived there and that he had offed himself in that house. And she told me how he did it. It was exactly the same as what I had picked up on. So I think when our frequency wow. gets really low, we can, we can, we can um, tune into other frequencies and and kind of like echoes of what has happened in in the vicinity where where I was living. So anyway, but that night I had an angelic visitation and I didn't ask for it. It was it they they chose to make themselves known to me. Now I'm saying they because the experience I'll just tell you very uh quickly how it went. It appeared as like like the stars in the sky and the image behind me, like a thousand points of light and it was all flashing out the sides, each point, and it looked like wings and it looked like angels. Now I'm filtering this experience through my own um, perceptional arena. And so I don't even know, is it ET? Is it angels? Like who knows, right? Like there isn't, there's a lot of overlap, I think in the um, metaphysical realms. Yeah, sure. So, um, so anyway, and when they spoke, it was like a thousand voices, but in perfect synchronization, like one voice. And they basically um, t told me that if I wanted to leave my, my mission in life or my, my human existence, I could do that. There are exit points. But, um, you know, is that what I really wanted? And I said, hell no. I said, I just tired of having a shitty life with nothing but problems and 
not knowing what the hell's going on. And I didn't know at the time I'm also neurodivergent. So I have a little bit different way of presenting and understanding and, and dealing with information than other people. Well, we didn't know any of that back then. So anyway, um, I said, no, I just, I just, I just want a better life. And I was 42 years old. And I said, I'm done with this shit. I'm not doing it anymore. And they said, well, we want to give you a gift. And I said, well, what do you mean by a gift? And they said, that's up to you to decide. And I said, well, I can't just tell you right now. I said, I'm overwhelmed with this whole experience. Can I think about it? And they said, of course you can. Karen, we're never far away from you. We're never far away from you. And anytime you tell us what you need and we'll, do, we'll, we'll make it happen for you. Now, at the time I was very naive because I didn't really understand what the nature of the gift would be. But anyway, so I thought about it for a few days. And of course, I decided not to off myself, which is probably a really good thing in retrospect. And um, <laughs> and um, so I was out walking, I was thinking and thinking, and I thought, well, gee, you know, if I had like a million dollars, boy, that would sure cure a lot of my problems. Maybe I need money. And I thought, mm, nope, that's not it. And then I thought, well, maybe if I was really popular or beautiful, if everybody loved me, maybe that would fix everything. And I went, no, that's not it. I just knew it wasn't it. And I just kept thinking of all these things. And then I realized, I realized what I needed was wisdom. Because if you have wisdom, you can provide for yourself. You can have the right kind of company. Everything, I could fix my life and have a decent life. And so I asked for wisdom. And the weirdest part about this um, is that they said, do you want the quick method or the slow method? And I went, I want the quick method. I want the quick method, right? I didn't want to spend any more years making all these mistakes and screwing up and everything. And, and that was sort of the end of it. I mean, um, they're always with me and I can communicate uh, anytime I need clarification or, you know, but I often don't because my job is to be a human being and to do it on my own. So anyway, after that, I thought the wisdom would just get poured into me, right? No, 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 no. I had all kinds of challenges. Some of them were horrific, but the difference was they were always with me. And I always knew, I always knew, could see timelines and I could see where each timeline would lead me right? And so that's how I built up the wisdom. And people might think nowadays, well, Karen, you're not that smart. What do you mean you got wisdom? But I do have wisdom. I know what I need to do. I know what my mission on earth is. Um, and I think that experience set me up for what came later, which was my, what I call my extraterrestrial experience, which was very, very different. Well, you have so, to be careful what you wish for, because if you yeah. ask for patience, you're going to get all these events yeah. coming at you, which will test your patience. If you yeah. ask for strength, you're going to get all these events coming at you. It's exactly. going to take all, all your strength. Right. And yeah, I've talked to a lot of people who've gone through really amazing experiences. One guy was a Mormon, a very devout Mormon, and his religion just didn't support the things that were happening to him. Mm -hmm. So he ended up becoming more spiritual. I mm -hmm. hear that quite a bit, uh, that you know people have a real hard time if they're devoutly religious when these things start happening not always um but yeah and i just want to tell you some of the things that it did allow for me it allowed me to lose almost 200 pounds it allowed me to become completely debt free which i've maintained to this day it's allowed yeah. me things that i that 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 you can't achieve if you don't have if you don't have wisdom and so i think it was the best gift to ask for and it was the best gift i ever received and the other thing, guys, it's made me strong like a diamond. I am a diamond, and I know that. And so um, I'm pretty unshakable. Doesn't mean I don't have bad days. Doesn't mean I don't have ups and downs. But I'm a diamond, and I'm really, really excited about that. I want to ask you a question. Okay, what you what you're saying? I've been following you for a while. Okay, and when I got introduced to you, I was um, quiet. I had my contacts telling me pay attention to this one, okay? And so I have. Let me ask you a question because you're you're talking to me exactly how this all works. Your walk and talk with what you have coming at you and where we're going and what's going on around us. One of the things that I've learned over the years because I have very many similar 
issues as you do, is that um, it's not just what I need to deal with here, but now I start to see the truth everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. You can't lie to me anymore. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm impenetrable with the lies. You cannot. I hear absolute truth. And it's uh, up to my responsibility and my moral gain higher and higher and higher. And I found out that that's the kind of wisdom that you wear because you employ that type of wisdom. You don't let people run amok around you and that people started noticing this about me and actually the one the really the ones that really wanted to be cons and whatever or talk bad things to me or use me started to move away from me they became uncomfortable in my presence i'm yes. wondering are you experiencing that oh yes i certainly do and um <clears throat> but you know uh one of the things that i've asked for that's part of my wisdom package is to learn how to be gracious and kind to everybody, regardless of whether they're scoundrels or not, uh, because I don't know their story and I don't know, I don't want to add to to the negativity. Yeah. And so I've actually actually, you know, practiced little scripts that I can use that are that are gracious and allow people to save face, even you know, but but clearly no is no, and um, and I'm really good at it and I love it. I love saying no. There's trick. Yeah in the word no absolutely you're a little bit further along with that than i am i'm just now starting to get that i'm more of a valkyrie and i solve all my problems by just no letting everybody have it and i've had in the last few years just to back it down and learn that if i come out and i talk to people i have to employ that kind of wisdom that realizing that they're just like i am no difference and to hear what they say and to be gracious exactly good word yeah, but that didn't also didn't just spontaneously happen for me. I've worked on it for years. I'm not kidding. And yeah. I've also worked on my body temple for years. So that includes what I eat, what I think, what I choose for entertainment, for companionship, on and on and on. And it's taken me years. I mean, this happened in, I don't know, I would say, oh, I don't know, maybe mid-1990s. You know, and I've been working on it ever since. I work on it every single day. And um, and sometimes probably I work on it too hard. But it's just really important for me because I'm not getting any younger. I'm 67 years old. We don't know how long we've got on this planet. The last thing I want is to realize this is it. I'm dying and go, oh, my God, I missed the boat. You know, I want to I want to I want to I want to have be something. I want to develop, um, I don't know, virtues that I can take with me. I don't exactly. want to come back to earth and do this crap over again. No Perfectly. way. Perfectly. Yeah. Right. That's his message to everybody on this planet. They want us all to take this path. All of us. You have to hear and listen to it, though. And uh, I'm very pleased that you're talking this way. You, This is awesome. So, okay. So what happened after, after you began that journey? And what was your first ET contact virtual? Well, that didn't happen until about, oh, I'd say 2012, 2013. I'm not real clear because I was real sick at the time. I mean, like this did not give me perfect health and perfect beauty and perfect money or any of that, you know, (laughs) to get where I'm at right now, which is a very, very good life. uh, You know, it was not a linear curve. Right. Right. So um, anyway, so um, it was the weirdest thing. Again, they contacted me. I didn't contact them. But I, I, I want to just go back a little bit and and let you know that it's intergenerational. So my mother was com- my mother was very psychic and a natural healer, although she was freaked out if you talked about anything to do with ET or anything because you know being a JW you, you you can't do that. So, but her mother was very psychic, was a natural healer, and had ET experiences. So, um, so and I knew about that, so I wasn't surprised. But basically, what happened is. I just started having these experience and I'll just tell you what it felt like to me. I'm not going to tell you what actually happened because I don't know. I'm just saying this is how it felt to me. I would start, I would go to bed at night and I wake up in the morning and I had had all these adventures. And at first I thought I was dreaming, but I go to bed that night. I go to bed at night in my bed and I'd wake up in my bed. Now, I don't know if I was physically taken, etherically taken, like who knows, who knows? This is, this is big stuff. But I had all these adventures and I had more adventures than you could ever fit in to one night. So I I may have had three weeks or three months or four months of adventure and then wake up in the morning 
and I'm back, you know, in my bed again. It was very strange. So at first I thought I was dreaming and then I realized, no, I'm not dreaming because, um, because, um, you know, when I dream, it, things are kind of disjointed and kind of hazy and don't necessarily make sense. And they may start, I may start off having one kind of adventure in a dream, but then it shifts to something else. It wasn't like that. This was absolute memory. And, um, and I thought, well, I wasn't surprised, surprised because of the angelic experience I'd had. But at the same time, I actually, uh, was a bit much. And so I actually uh, uh, worried that maybe I was just crazy, what, whatever that means. Maybe I'm completely I've heard that a million times. Crazy <laughs> insane. <laughs> Always. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, maybe I have some kind of weird high need for attention yeah. or like, I don't know. I went through it all, and it, but it just kept happening and happening every night. And it, and it lasted for three months, every night for three months, and then it stopped. And I think I probably could go back, but I have so much to unpack and, and to present to humanity that until I get that job done, I don't really want to have uh, necessarily more experiences. And the reason I remember, uh, that was the other thing I was told, is that there's millions of us that are doing this, but most right. don't remember because it's very difficult to, to reintegrate back into human life on planet Earth during these days. Very difficult. I got to tell you, uh, it got to the point after about a month of this, I'd wake up in the morning and go, oh, shit, I'm back. Oh, God. And, you know, after you spend time with these beings that are that are our next stage of evolution and you see that they don't have the constructs that are confining us here, constructs of thought, things like racism and gender and all kinds of things and religion. They don't have any of that uh, that doesn't even come up in, into thought, you know, and then to come back here and to deal with everybody, it quite clearly looks like humankind is insane, completely insane. And it's scary and it's disturbing. But yeah, I know well, we are. I think we actually truly are. <laughs> so I had, but I had the mission, you know, to, 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 um, to, first of all, it took me a couple of years, guys, to unpack this in my own mind, maybe longer. Even now, sometimes I'm still unpacking it because it's, it's huge. It's so huge. It's very, um, can be sort of disorienting. So what I did from that point on is I, I, I told a few people, and everyone was just kind of going, yeah, well, that's Karen, you know, ha, ha, ha. And I just then I just stopped talking about it, and I actually stopped even um, integrating myself into um, into into my um, community, into my neighborhood, and even my family. I just had to sort of go, okay, I'm a stranger in a strange land when I'm here. It's the other life that's the real life, that's the life that's meaningful and makes sense. So then, in the midst of all of this, I got a what I'm going to call a download, which was a packet of a lot of information that I also had to unpack. And I took that information and I organized it into what I call the nine steps to quantum health transformation, which is an absolutely free program online and it's everything we need to get ready for contact. And um, I can talk about that a little bit later if you want. But um, so I had to organize that. And um, and I had, there's so many things I had to do, change my diet. And then a little later, I'd change it again and all kinds of all kinds of work. It's been really a lot of work. And um, but I'm not complaining because I am so satisfied with my life. I am so, so satisfied. I'm working on my book and uh, it's take out, you know, I told Preston what two years ago, I'm working on my book and, and, and then, and then I get stalled. There's reasons for that, but. Um, Do you uh, consider I hope part of this process that you're going through is actual personal healing for you? Oh, absolutely. There's no separation between my personal healing, my personal evolution, my experiences, my training, you know, on board the big ship, I call it the big ship. Um, um, my relationships with other beings, my relationships with humans. There's really no, for me, I don't see any separation. Everything affects everything else and we're all, it's all connected. Right. Absolutely. Wow. So you, you skimmed over a lot of what's going on here because I know there's so, so much. I mean, we've talked about it. You, you have a lot of really amazing details to your experiences. So you're going on all these adventures and first, 
you're thinking, oh my gosh, is this dreams? I remember Dolly definitely mentioned that when she was a little girl. Uh, but this was when you were, you know, not, not too long ago when this all this started, right? The, so had you gotten any sort of physical manifestations and like by that I mean any evidence that this was physical? Any UFO sightings? You know, any like um, waking up in the wrong way on your bed or something? You know what I mean? Or anything? Yeah, like I, I, I mean, I, I have seen uh, actually maybe three or four different kinds of UFOs. And, I, and, and what's weird is that why would I look up to that exact spot in the sky at that exact time to see them? So I think there's a connection, right? Oh, I'd love to hear about a couple of those. Okay. What did you see? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> don't mind. Okay, I'll tell you the coolest one. The coolest one is I, I was driving from Victoria on Vancouver Island up to Courtney. So it's kind of like the southern tip to the midpoint, not quite the midpoint of Vancouver Island. And I was driving up at night and the highway winds along, um, the, most of it winds along the coast. And, um, and I was getting kind of sleepy and I, and I pulled over and, uh, on the right, on, at a rest, sort of a rest, a rest, not really a rest stop, but a place you could pull off the main, the main road. And I was just taking a little rest and I was looking out towards the water and I saw two lights that looked like headlights. And I thought, oh, there must be an island or something, and there must be a vehicle there that's facing me, and they can see my lights, and I can see their lights. That must be what it is. And I didn't think much of it. And, I, and I, then I got back in the car, and I'm driving up island, and these two lights follow me. Well, there's no way there was any little island long enough that they could still be two lights facing <laughs> in my direction for me to see visually. And they followed me all the way up to the, to the next town. And the next time I drove down island again, I looked and there was no island out there. There was nothing out there but water. So that was pretty cool and pretty, um, pretty I don't know, obvious that, <laughs> I, that it was UFOs or a UFO or whatever. Something with two, two big bright lights on it. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and another time I looked up and I I wasn't sure what I was looking at. So I was kind of squinting and really looking up there. And I realized it was a cigar-shaped kind of silver in color um, mm -hmm. object. And then at the, at the right-hand uh, nose of it, all of a sudden there formed uh, a rainbow-colored, like a, a, like a disc, a rainbow-colored like a disc. And as it went into the disc, it slowly got shorter and shorter because it was disappearing inside of this rainbow disc. And the rainbow kind of came out and covered it. And as it went in, it just sort of dissolved and then the disc disappeared. So it'd be like looking at a disc sideways, like just the narrow side, and then it disappeared. And I thought, my goodness, that is cool. Were you over land or over water when you saw that? Land. Okay. It was over land when I saw that one. And then the third one that I saw, well, I've also seen orbs, but I don't really, I don't really know what they are. Um, they, I'm not sure what they are, so I don't class them as UFOs necessarily. But another time I was driving up island, and I saw this huge ball with a, with a fairly short stream tail out the back end, and it was just like a ball of golden or copper colored glitter. And it was coming down, coming down, coming down. And I'm, I'm driving and I'm trying to drive and watch this thing come down. And I passed by on my left side, sort of a low, um, I don't, I, they kind of look like mountains, but they're probably not tall enough to be mountains. So kind of high hills. A lot of the mountain or rocky bits are, are carved out for the highway, you know, to go, to go along side between the water and the and, and the mountain, but so let's just say it was little mountains. And um, and this thing just sort of landed um, out of my view at, at the top of one of these little mountains. And I thought it must be a comet or something. And I when I got home, I looked at through the news and everything and there was no mention of a comet or anything like that. And I have no idea what that was, but it was pretty cool and very, very beautiful, very sparkly. What color was it exactly? Was it? I would say kind of like if you took glitter 
that was copper and gold and you put it in a big ball, big ball. So there's little tiny bits of copper and little tiny bits of gold. That's what it looked like. And it was shining and the sun hadn't quite set, it was starting to get low. It was just absolutely spectacular. You saw a little tail coming out of it? It definitely had a tail. It okay. definitely had a tail, you but not a long tail. Hmm? Can you estimate how high up that was? Do you have any idea? Oh, well, at the closest point to me, maybe 100 feet. Oh, wow. That's yeah. close. Yeah, very close. This is not something, not like the cigar shape that was so far away, I was like squinting to see it. No, this was really close. Well, it's, it's significant because it's a rare contactee that doesn't have multiple sightings. And that's definitely something I look for. And when something is close, that's even more of a, well, red flag, I guess, would be one way of putting it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's, and were these going on when you were having these nighttime adventures? Is that the same, um, same no, period? This was, this was before that. This was before, ah. this was after I left religion, after my angelic experience, but before my ET experience. Okay, because that is a pattern too. They will introduce themselves <laughs> sort of and get you prepared. So here is a question I want to jump in because uh, this sort of relates to the fact that you're having these things going on at night. And this is from Robert Allen Yaffe. And this is a good question. He says, it is. did the adventures leave you exhausted when you woke up? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Really? Uh, exhausted is not the word for it. Re like even weak, physically weak. Yeah. Yeah. I was Definitely. just talking to a friend of mine who I think is a contactee and she said basically the same thing. She's like, what was I doing all night? I felt like yes. I was <laughs> Well, you know, now of course I was, I was doing, you know, um, expeditions on planets. I was doing, you know, exopolitical ambassador work. I was, learning so much about the culture, learning how to talk, to talk without my mouth. You see, um, the ET beings that are on the big ship, they're real tidy around their mouth. They're not like us. Like it, like it would be offensive for them, for me to be talking the way I am now to them. We're, we're loud and we're juicy and we got teeth and they don't do that. It's all done through telepathy. And so learning how to... Um, quiet my mind and be more purposeful and mindful about my thoughts. That was the biggest chore of, of being there. Well, yeah, Dolly talked about how some of her experiences would go for, on for a long time. And really, it's just one night, you know, yeah. a week yeah. or two. Yeah, yeah there's a time violation for sure. <laughs> I would be gone for sometimes three weeks, almost a month one time, and come back within minutes of leaving and... Um, uh, I had to unpack myself at that point because it's like living two different lives. It know? is. It, it it really is, which is why I thought so I was crazy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I thought so, yeah, I had... so you, I'm just so involved in trips to another, I mean, what you perceive to be another planet right. and, and ships and, I mean, the whole deal, right? The whole deal. The whole deal. Yeah. Well, what's the most... Okay. I'm dying to know this. What? I'm dying to know this. What do you have one specific place that you've been taken to that upended you? In other words, it's the one that left the most lasting impression on you. Do you have one? Hmm, that's a good <laughs> There's so much, Dolly. I don't know. Uh, I remember the orientation uh, process because that's when I first was there. I was just there. And I didn't know what was going on, but I never, I never felt afraid. None of my experiences involved being afraid. There was no, nothing but harmony and peace and love and people. I want to clarify something because, you know, everyone's going, oh yeah, light and love. We're all in the love. We're all in the love. But you know, what does that mean? Love is a basket of, it contains elements that are not easy to achieve. So when we love, it means that we're being patient with others. We're being mild with others. You know, we're seeing the best in other people. We're, we're, we're doing everything we can to be good. Uh, you know, and so once, once, once you're in an environment, oh, that's what I call a loving environment, these beings, because right. partly because they're intuitive and psychic, but nobody would ever do anything to harm or ruffle up another being. It wouldn't happen. 
In fact, um, and, and so there's, there isn't that ego thing. It doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong. There's none of that going on. It's so peaceful. And um, I, I really, I really like being there a lot. I'm, I'm hoping that when I die, maybe I can go back and just be there because I, I really liked it a lot. My, the work was so meaningful. Do, do you want to know the different kinds of work they do up there? Oh, sure. well, I want to know everything. I want to know what they look yeah, like. You know. these okay. <laughs> okay, well, let me tell you. I want to know, know clothes. I want to know oh, everything. Okay, yeah. yeah, I got all of that. So, but I don't remember everything, guys. So feel free to ask. But if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know because I'm not going to make it up. I don't do that. So, um, so the beings look very much like us. Most are taller with larger frames. You know those pictures of the Anunnaki and and um, and uh, stuff, you know, where they're super buff and they got the big beards and they got the big curly hair. OK, well, they don't all necessarily even have hair. Well, some just don't wear their hair. But um, that th most of them are built like that. They're 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 majestically beautiful. They're so healthy. They're so incredibly healthy. There's no sickness you know, and they live for about, I don't know, about 500 years, but procreation and partnering and all that stuff all takes place within the first 100 years. And the other 400 or longer or less, depending on what they want, they don't get old and sick and die. They, they just, when they've had enough and they want to move on to the next course, then, then they, they actually create ritual and ceremony around the passing and you choose when you want to pass. But anyway, getting back, to what they look like, um, but there was there's definite differences. And I'll tell you why people say, well, where are they from? Are they from the Pleiades? Are they from this or that? No, they're not from any of those places. And the beings are from many different places. And I'm just gonna call them places because that can include also what I think are interdimensional realities. Preston, I sent, I sent you a, an image. I don't know if you can share it or not, but uh, if, you, if you can't, that's okay. But if you think of a Venn, there we go, a Venn diagram. Okay, so if you look at here, we have A, B, C, D, and E. Each of those ovals represents a dimensional reality. Now, this is also a really good template for what, why I think on Earth we can see, you know, Sasquatches and fairies and things. I think that there are places where there's overlap between dimensional realities. So, so Dolly and I, maybe we share the places where A and E um, connect and overlap, you know. Okay, wait, before you go on, let me just describe this a little bit for the people who are just listening. Oh, yeah, yeah, good idea. Yeah, because what we're looking at is, what, about six or seven ovals that are sort of in a... Actually, five. Five? A, yes. A, yeah, and they overlap. A, yeah, a daisy sort of pattern, and they're overlapping. In the center, we have, there's oval A, B, C, D, and E. It's a good schematic for do, to describe the fact that uh, we have we're in a mainframe in this uh, galaxy or our universe. Within our entire universe, there are twelve dimensions, and we overlay one another. We're all in the same space. It's just that you here in the third dimension can't look into or behind you into them at all. They can though outside of us because they don't have space time like we do. They can see through at us. They know we're yeah. here. They can communicate with us as well. People are walking around with like, you know, guardian angels. It's really an interdimensional being that lives with you and watches over you a little bit. It's it's an interesting yeah, Well, this shows how, how these other dimensions aren't yeah. far removed from us. Right there. Right. We're right here overlapping. Yeah. So, yeah, I like this. And it's beautiful, and so too. <laughs> the big ship is sitting in the very center, A, B, C, D, and E. So here we're not only having beings who immigrate from different star quadrants and galaxies. We're also getting possibly uh, beings from different timelines, from different um, dimensional realities. So um, that's where the ship is. So, so and, and the beings are not from any specific place. So they immigrate and they live aboard the big ship. Many of them were born on the big ship. And there is also, um, you know, um, partnering or what we would call marriage between beings from different backgrounds and so like you you can't you can't they're just so far from a homogenous group it isn't even funny and yeah. um and just like on earth you know how we have um variations on skin tone we have variations on sizes of noses colors of eyes whether our hair is soft and fluffy or or curly you know like it's it's 
the same thing goes goes there and but it, with even more diversity because of all because of all this other uh you know potential from where they're from so um but um i thought there are some that are actually shorter than us and they they do have different cultures but again because they live by a love harmonic which is very respectful and very peaceful there's no conflict we can accept each other for the way the way that we are and it's nobody's made fun of there's none of that because they're not insecure like it's just so beautiful to see what our potential is and to come back to earth and to see everybody backbiting and arguing. And it's so sad. It's so sad. I don't think it's everybody's individual fault or failing either. I think it's, I think it's what's happened within what I call the matrix or the construct. And when we learn to step outside of that construct, that's where the, the true living is and there isn't competition. So I've learned so much from these beings. But anyway, I'm going to tell you about two of the more unusual kind of people that I met. And I'm calling them people because they're they're my friends. They're, they're my people. You know, I'm, I feel very connected to them. So um, one group um, have um, a, a way of picking up patterns on their skin. So, for instance, on Earth, we have octopods like octopus and they can and we have um, those little those little lizards and whatever they're they're over they pick up the pattern and the coloring of that they have little sensors in their skin well these are people, photo it's uh, cells that actually have uh, have photos, photosynthesis in them that can actually uh, turn on a color with an enzyme and yes. it's like an array yeah yeah and we so have they have the ability like cuttlefish have, yeah they can do anything they have the ability that. to they have the ability to do that and from their genetic history and by the way Birth, births are not regulated, but they are documented. So anyone can find out, you know, who, where, where they come from or, or whatever. But anyway, that, that I guess they used to camouflage. Well, on the big ship, they weren't camouflaging. But what was interesting is they chose the brightest and um, very complex pattern on their fabrics for the clothing they wore. And it would pick up a little on their skin, right? And it was just really, really beautiful. Uh, so there was that. And then another thing that I thought was really interesting is they had some beings who uh, either either their skin would create pigment or they have pigment, but the pigment can actually move on their face and it actually gives away their uh, more, more of their emotional content. So for instance, if somebody's trying to get someone's attention across the room, um, um, they can get their attention and actually sort of like, you know, come Just here or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Through, through, through a little bit of rearranging of pigment. I thought that was really cool. And um, I didn't see any giants, um, but there was like my buddy that I, everyone gets assigned a buddy during orientation. And my buddy, she's quite a bit taller than me, like at least, at least a foot taller than me. And, um, but she had fairly pale skin. They try to match mm -hmm. us up to whoever's most similar to us in the beginning till we get used to our environment. And, um, but her skin had kind of like a teal tone to it. So most wow. of the beings we would consider people of color. Um, there's not that many that are as pale as me, um, but, um, um, but sometimes they would have tones of sort of orange or tones of sort of teal, you know, but basically not a lot of difference, really not a lot of difference than here. Uh, yeah. what, what about like food and restrooms and things like that? Oh, yeah. I always, that? I, as soon as I tell the bathroom story, everybody sort of shuts off and goes, oh, God, she's making that shit up because it's. <laughs> no, no, Dolly that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. She's like, oh, yeah, they have restaurants yeah, on board. Well, I've heard, I heard <laughs> only a few other people describe it. So that's why. Let's do, let's do food before we do pooping because it doesn't <laughs> go in that order, okay? So the, food, the food on the big ship grows natural and in every department. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So the other thing we should probably get into is the big ship because it's actually alive. It's actually a conscious being. 
and oh, it wow. has I always talk about a, that too. Yeah. a circulatory <laughs> system and it has a, a respiratory system, but the respiratory is what gives us our atmosphere. The circulatory system is what gives us our baths, um, serves for the deconstruction and reconstruction of everything that we no longer use. So basically every day you end up with fresh clothes and fresh everything. It's really cool. Yeah, they, they don't do long well, ever. I'll get, I'll get into that a bit. But anyway, so the food grows goes everywhere. And you just sort of pick a few things what you want. And you, you go to the um, what I would call food stations. And it's the coolest thing. Now, the ship itself, it has every capacity to do whatever it wants at any part of it that it wants at any time. I don't know whether it's nanotechnology or what. So we go to the area where we want to eat, where we want to prepare our food or where we want to eat. And it's just like this system comes up from the floor and just forms. It just forms very quickly right in front of you. There's no pixelation or anything like that. It just comes up and it forms. It has both heating and cooling. And everybody just lies around um, because when you lay on the on the floor, the floor becomes extremely comfortable and sort of pliable to your body shape right and it's kind of like the old days of the romans where they would sit around on these cots and and eat that's how how we eat there but anyway um different beings take pride in doing different things some make what we would consider cheeses and some make fermented things and sauces and they have their little speciality and and because everything's abundant you know, you don't have to pay for anything. Everybody just shares everything. And so the food was just a fabulous, fabulous experience. And generally we would eat one full meal a day with probably another one that was more of a social snacking meal. We didn't eat a lot, not like we do here on earth. And um, so that's the food <clears throat> in one end and out the other. So the bathroom, <laughs> the bathroom I discovered um, in orientation. So and this is the other thing that's confusing about my experience is I had absolutely physical experiences there, right. even though I have no evidence that I was physically there. Like I know that's weird. So in orientation, anyway, my, my, my buddy, she was really kind. So anyway, after I met her and stuff, then we went down th this corridor. And I'm going to tell you the shape of everything is different than here. It's not all cubicle and square the way we have it here. Um, in West Coast Native art, they have a symbol called an ovoid, and it's not a circle. It's kind of flat on the bottom, and that kind of circles over the top. It's a really beautiful basic symbol for their artwork. Well, that was sort of the shape. When you go down the corridors or you're in the rooms, they're all in that shape. None of them are um, square. There's no corners anywhere and, and that I saw. So anyway, so we're going down this corridor, and... Um, and then she turns to the wall and I'm looking and all of a sudden just a door appears, like not a door like what we have, just an opening. Mm -hmm. And we went in and then the opening just disappeared. It's so cool. So everything becomes what you need. You see, the ship is also psychic and it's conscious. So it knows what you need and where you're going and it just provides it. I know it doesn't make any sense, but it's just how, how it was. No, no it so does. We, Dolly talked all about this. Many contactees have told me this same sort of thing. This oh. is what I love about what yeah, you're I, I asked a lot. I have them. There are no square rooms. I was like desperate to find one when yeah. I was a kid. You know, why? Why can't you do that? And he said, it's not economical for me to do that. And I have to hold a uh, the position of it for it's just too angular we don't do angular I don't yeah know. yeah they don't they don't do angular they don't do angular nothing was angular <laughs> yeah. um yeah. so anyway so we're we're in there and then um and then um she just motioned to the wall and out from the floor came this platform and it had like a like a a big giant cushion on it and she just motioned for me to lay down and try it. And I laid down. It was ever so comfy. And I knew that was my bed. And then I got up. <clears throat> I didn't know how to really communicate with telepathy at that point. My thoughts are all over. And I'm sure everybody could hear everything, what, what I'm thinking, whatever. I don't know. But um, And then I had to pee. And she knew I had to pee because I had to pee. And I guess I was saying it loud. They, I've been told that I'm a very loud um, psychic communicator. 
I'm 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 very loud. In fact, I have to work yes, at we are. Yeah. pulling that back. <laughs> <Stop screaming. laughs> yeah. So anyway, so then another little door appeared. Um, so this was my this was my quarters, and the little door appeared, and I went inside, and then the door disappeared behind me, and out from the floor came another little platform, and I would say it was about uh, maybe two feet by two feet, not not that big, just came out from the floor. And then out from the center of that came this thing. It was like a tube, but it was oval. And it was like about maybe this big around. And it was kind of um, pleated when it came up. It was kind of pleated. And I knew that was where I parked it. So um, I dropped my <laughs> drawers, park it, do my business. And when I was done, it was interesting. There was kind of like a little poof of air. And then the whole thing just collapsed down and the platform just went back into the wall. And I was dry and clean. Like, um, you don't have to use toilet paper or anything. This, whatever this is that's in this little poof of air, it just sort of, I don't know if it's enzymes or what, it just kind of dissolves anything and dries it. And it's just, you're, you're just. Wow, this know. is astonishing to hear because this is so similar to what Dolly has described to me. It's funny when I first started talking to you, I'm like, Dolly, you're going to have to meet Karen. She reminds yeah. me so much of you. And I hadn't heard any of this. But just it, just you know. Well, how could I know it, and how could Dolly know it, and we we never swap stories, you know. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm just saying. Anyway, so um, so that was that was that was the bathroom. I thought that was really really cool. And the same thing, if you wanted, you know, a, a shower or you wanted a basin for water, it all happened the same way. Anyway, so that was that was fantastic. And when we left, she. Um, uh, didn't tell me, but indicated, I guess, because it's telepathy, that I should think of something that I like from home. And I was thinking of, um, I was thinking of a bunch of um, tulips that were different colors. And the image of that um, was then on the wall. So I knew where to find my quarters if I came down there with, without her. And she stayed with me like 24 seven until I was really comfortable being there on my own, which slept next to me, everything until I felt really comfortable. Mine so, was a fuller brush from home. It's a big wooden brush, you know, from the fuller brush company. Yeah. And it was chunky, you know, and they brought it up for me and I left it there. I thought I lost it. I'm not kidding you. I, I was like, where the hell? It was there. Oh, it's still there to this day. I know another lady who said it, it was a teacup. That was her teacup that she had. So yeah. I guess this is a thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, really I want to know who the female is that you're talking about. Yeah, what's her name? She doesn't have a name. Nobody has names. But the closest right. that I could say is, and this is me very inaccurately trying to describe her, is um, peaceful, peaceful blossom narrow tongue. Yeah. Because her ancestry came from people from, uh, I don't know where, some world, where they actually fed from these huge... Mm -hmm. Um, lotus type uh, blossoms and their food, their sustenance. And so their tongues are longer than a little bit, little bit well, actually quite a bit longer than my tongue, maybe twice as long. And so her jaw was kind of narrower and her tongue was narrower and longer. She showed it to me. I thought it was really, yeah. actually really cute, but she was beautiful. She was very tall and mm -hmm. she had, <clears throat> have you ever seen those, um, <clears throat> those, um, guinea pigs where they have all the little cowlicks all over yeah. all over them their hair is yeah. all in these little swirls well her hair was like that and bright orange her eyes were like brown with gold highlights her skin was very pale similar to mine but more with a teal tone to it and she just wore um kind of like a like a poncho just a very simple poncho so they don't they don't have the same you know social norms that we have about clothing mm -hmm. some wear very little some wear lots some really like to be draped in a lot of fabric. Um, you want to hear something funny? I want to tell you this. I got to tell you this. Okay. Preston got a report from somebody talking about a, an ET that had really long, tall, orange hair. Okay. And he described very much like what you're describing. He didn't describe the tongue, but I knew it was there. I've seen the males of that group and they wear their hair straight up. Like, you know, like we do the Indian thing, you know, the, yeah. they wear their hair straight up. It, the males do because they think they're beautiful that way. 
And when I told he when he told me that I didn't hear this story yet. This is the first time I've heard this. You're making me laugh because they do exist. They really are. They're there. <laughs> You know? well, 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 guys, we need to take a quick station break. So okay. just hold on a second. I want to let everyone know you're listening to The Light Gate. This is episode 10. I'm Preston Dennett, your host, and my lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. Our guest tonight is Karen Holton, experiencer, and so much more. You're listening to the United Public Radio Network on 107.7. FM coming from the beautiful city of New Orleans, also the UFO Paranormal Radio Network 105.3. We're also streaming on numerous platforms Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, is it Ro Roku even? Roku, uh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, several others. We're definitely getting out there. And yeah, we're now on our second hour. The questions in chat are stacking up, Karen. So I'm going to. And I never, ever have enough time to get to them, so I want to start putting some of them out. Uh, but before I do, well, this is kind of related. I'm assuming that they've, you know, they're teaching you all kinds of things, right? All these different sort of classes and information and wisdom. So here is a question from DGK, and I don't know how well this applies or if you can answer this. But he asks, would Karen have learned what Earth was like before the last Ice Age? during these adventures. So I'm sure they taught you all kinds of things. I'm not sure if they told you about, you know, prehistoric earth or before this iteration of our civilization. Well, <clears throat> I don't know yeah. if it's uh, like earth right now is extremely dysfunctional and most of the beings on the big ship have never heard of earth. If, wow. Unless I'm communicating with them about my experience on earth, they would not even know about Earth. Most of them wouldn't even know about it. So what happens is they would be so disturbed if they knew what was going on and how we live. They would be so disturbed. These are gentle, gentle people. But what I did learn, and more pertains to the question, is that this is the fifth reseeding of Earth. Earth has been whatever, for whatever reason, whether it's like ice ages or... Um, natural cataclysms, or like today, nefarious beings, you know, that don't have the best interests of the population or whatever, right? This is the fifth receding. So I don't know what the earth was like before uh, before the, the last ice age. No, they never told me that. And in fact, we don't, we don't talk about earth much. It's disturbing. And what's going on here <laughs> We ha we're we're steeped in it. We don't even. I'm sure many of you must know how disturbing it is. But to be, it would be like subjecting children to, I don't know, a, a horror movie. You know, to be honest. Yeah. Right. Wow. So what what kind of things? Did, I mean, do they have classes there? Do you go there? Because Dolly talks about how she learned how to fly. Yeah, I got no boat ride. I was so conscious. I was okay. The only the difference between me is I I started really young, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I was in school young, and I had more time than you have to to pan out everything and learn it as I you know as a from a young person to an older age, and so yeah, I know a lot about our history, galactically, you know, our galaxy, our solar system, all of it, and um, what they've taught you about the five. That's generally what they do give out to the older people. They're there are five. Actually, the people on this planet who do uh, study, you know, archaeology and ge geotectonics and any anything that would give them a clue as to what went on here, they know that there are the last five they have evidence of, and they don't talk to people about it. So you were you've been given what's obvious to us right now, and should we should know. And if you're going to teach it, teach it because it's important for us everybody here realized that, that this is not a permanent place for us. Mm -hmm. We're here for a reason and mm -hmm. things happen. We had a 12,000 year cycle on this planet and um, we have to understand that we're not here to act like idiots. You know, we're not here to hurt one another or not be able to communicate. And, and we don't communicate. We use language and it's uh, not specific enough. It doesn't give you what you've learned volumes of information all at one time concept is just gone for people common sense are gone for people here truth is gone for people here and mm -hmm. they don't communicate 
with their minds, and they should. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, yeah, well, if we all had telepathy, it would be such a different world. And that's right. what's so amazing about where you're having these experiences. Well, we do have it. We just have had it shut down and had it replaced with language. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. But um, I was going to say the learning environment is very interesting. The other thing I want to tell you, it's nothing like being like, I love one of my favorite um, science fiction series and genre is Star Trek. Well, it's nothing like Star Trek. In Star Trek, you've got all these people sitting at stations mm-hmm. with screens and they're touching all these dials. There was none of that, absolutely none of that going on there. And we had quite a bit of free time, but um, we had um, different ways of learning. So the primary, uh, <clears throat> I would say the two primary ways that we learned is one through our tablets. And I know this sounds uh, quaint because we have tablets here, but these look like sort of plexiglass or glass. They're they're fairly thin. Uh, they're a little bit rounded corners. They're all uh, rectangle shaped, and <clears throat> there's no dials or or buttons or import uh, docking <laughs> anything like that. It just looks like it's an inanimate piece of glass. But on it, we can either look at things in two dimensional or in three dimensional, more like a pop-up hologram. But but the other thing that was really cool was, um, um, it's it's it, don't confuse it with what we have here on Earth. You know how on Earth they have that uh, virtual reality where you put on the goggles? Oh, well, it wasn't like that. It was like a, just a little band that went around, put it on the back and it went around and it sort of stopped here, just like a little band. And at that point, it helped us to communicate directly with the big ship. And the big ship had a thing that is similar to what we have here called the cloud, where all the information is there and we could just access it. So it'd be like reclining, putting this on and kind of like lucid dreaming. And that's how we would learn. So, for instance, I was training to do botany work. That, that's the other thing I want to tell you, the primary purposes of, of the being on, beings on the ship. One is to host the exopolitical um, meetings where um, all kinds of um, all kinds of beings come together and make decisions on, you know, um, courses of action. Um, I don't know; it could be anything. And I have the least amount of memories from that kind of work, but I know I do that kind of work. I still do that kind of work. I don't need to remember it. It's something that I just go and do, and it's very etheric. But the other experiences were very physical. So then there are the beings that are just, they act as hosts and they act as crew, you know, to to, to the big ship. And they just, they live there. And they interact with some of the other big ships. And there's a cross um, kind of um, updates and culture and different things like that. It's very, very, uh, a lot of emphasis put on culture. Um, Then there's also the um, expeditions where we go to other worlds and, Um, we do um, just gather information with our tablets. And when we do that, we stick to a very small area. Um, The area is quarantined. We have no interaction with the animals. We just gather uh, information. And we go through the actual experience of of being on the planet and what it it was all like. Later, when we're back on the big ship, uh, it's all put together into a giant kind of a holographic representation of the biosphere. So they're very ecologically minded and they would never just take people like for instance on earth right now, if there was a comet gonna come and and, and exterminate humans, they're not gonna just evacuate everybody off and put them into these beautiful pristine worlds. Not until we evolve to the point where we're trainable and we can uh, live in harmony and peace. If we can't do that amongst ourselves or even within the families, our families of origin, they're sure as a heck not gonna put us into these beautiful places. So there's uh, many, 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 many worlds. They have everything except humanoids. They've got the fish and they got the, the plants and they've got the, the atmosphere and they've got everything. And, 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 and so we gather all that information. And they do facilitate, and that's the third thing that they do, a resettlement, an intergalactic resettlement program for societies that have evolved to the point where they can be resettled and not screw up where they're where they're going to be placed. You know what I mean? There has to be a certain level of, of maturity. The other thing I want to talk about is the healing pods, because I was taught that you can't just take a human off of Earth and stick them somewhere, say, in Alpha Centauri or something like that. 
every planet has its unique frequency, its unique atmosphere, gravity, nutritional content of, of the foods. Everything is a little bit different. So I was shown in my orientation this huge room, like more like a huge auditorium, like the size of a baseball field, uh, sorry, uh, football field. Now, remember, the ship is so large, it hosts millions of beings, like, like a New York or San Francisco, like a huge city, okay? So anyway, we went in there, and there was all these sort of bean-shaped pods everywhere. Some were as short as like five feet long, and some of them were really long, like 35 feet long. So I assumed they were for giants. Anyway, we went up to one that was about my size, a little bit bigger, and she just motioned to it, and it opened up kind of like a clam, and I got inside, and it, the uh, underneath me it was very moss-like and, and kind of moist the way, if you ever get a chance to go into an old-growth forest, and the way the air is very moist and full of all this um, um, energy and um, like uh, essential fragr oil fragrance fragrances from all the trees and bushes and everything. And it's all very, very uh, lovely experience. Anyway, so the, the lid came back down. And to be honest with you, I fell asleep. I have no idea how long I was in there, but it was a very, very beautiful experience. Then it would open up and I'd get out and I'd feel like a million dollars. So we use these to recondition before we go down to a planet so that we can be comfortable there. We also use them early in the orientation process so that we can acclimatize ourselves to living on the ship, which is kind of like a neutral environment from be for beings with all kinds of different, uh, perhaps biological needs. So that was just sort of how that happened. So um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to mention that because I think it's quite important. There's a lot of people who claim to travel to a lot of different planets and stuff. And, and I, I believe them. I, I, why wouldn't I? I don't know. I, I don't necessarily expect people to believe me. But my, I suspect they would spend some time in these healing pods um, to be conditioned so that they could go and do that. All right. So do these experiences evolve as you went on? And I know you're writing a book, but Robert Allen Yaffe has this question. So do you enter your experiences in a journal? Um, no. No, I don't. I just go straight from memory, um, which is partly why I'm doing the, doing the book. Uh, and that's partly why the book isn't done is because I don't always have instant recollection. I Sometimes I'll think about something and I go, yes, that's what happened, right? Because then I remember. It's not because that'd be a lot of information to be packing around in my, in my conscious mind all the time. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> um, and in the beginning, uh, you know, I thought I was dreaming and then I thought I was crazy. And then I, I, it took me a couple of years. I was really disoriented for a couple of years. Like when you have an experience of this magnitude, you know, you don't just wake up and make your coffee and hang out with your friends and go back to your old way. Your whole life changes. Your perceptual arena, everything changes. And I wish to hell I had written it down, but I, I didn't. Well that, well, that kind of speaks to this question coming from Dana Matthews which is certainly what Dolly has described to me. Are you able to compartmentalize all areas of your life with all this going on? And do you feel peaceful about it? So you're saying it did cause strife in the beginning, but uh, well, how I'll do you deal you, with all this? Since I learned how to exit the construct, it's a lot easier. So let me just tell you, I am not normal in any way anymore, and I'm never going <laughs> back to the way I was before. So what happens is I don't need to compartmentalize it. What I do is I live very much in the present moment, in the now. And so if I get a memory or something comes to me, then I think about it. Otherwise, you know, um, I might be working on one of my character defects or something like that. Like, it's a very different reality when you step outside of the construct. And the more you do it, the more addictive it becomes because, um, because you're just in that present moment. And so it's just beautiful. And you, you look out the window and there's birds. I mean, you know, yeah, at seven o'clock, I have to go and meet with, with Preston and Dolly because I got a show tonight. You know, there's some of that for sure. I have to keep a, a journal, a daytimer, right, to keep track of what I'm doing. But most of the time, I'm in the flow. I'm in this amazing flow. And what's so cool about it is you can actually expand time and contract time depending 
I, you know, I know every bird in my yard. I know their little personalities, they got their little dramas going on. Like my life, I'm not thinking about uh, politics. I'm not thinking about, oh my God, what does my butt look like in these jeans? Like I do not have normal thoughts anymore because that's, that's kind of the matrix and the construct that keeps us um, <clears throat> confined and keeps yes. us from being free and discovering what's on the inside. You so, become a very wide open psychic. Every day is a new journey. Oh, so a new uh, event coming in at you, different thoughts. Yeah. Well, it's it's like a it's like a smorgasbord in front of you, and you can go this way or this way or this way, and experience so many things. And it's weird because at some point you realize you're looking into other dimensions with your own mind. Yeah. And, you can go anywhere and you can do any, you can do, and you're not imagining it. I mean, you are and you aren't like a lot of people don't get what the pineal gland is all about. The pineal gland is actually, can I talk about it just for a minute? Yeah, of course. I think it's an important part of this. The pineal gland is a gland in your brain and it's got rods and cones on the inside rods and cones, which are what give us vision, allow us to see. And there it's lined with those. And then what happens is our bodies produce these gases that the eyes see and create meaning out of. Well, that's the housing where this other dimensional realities can then interface. And so angelic beings, ET beings, they can help um, <clears throat> sort of direct what the pineal gland is seeing. And so when, you close, when I close my eyes and I see something, like if I close my eyes and, and I imagine a, a big, beautiful orange rose or something, right? Um, <clears throat> that's because this is what I'm seeing inside this little gland. It's the coolest thing. I want to give you a heads up, okay? I'm going to teach you something you don't know, okay? It's <laughs> your due. You're due. You need to understand this. Your pineal gland is part of your endocrine system, and it does perceive light and dark. It knows day and night. It regulates your circadian rhythms, but it does something else. It is a transponder. It is a receiver of, of brain waves. It also receives the thoughts and brain waves of other things outside of you. It is the conscious connection between your higher self, your consciousness, who you really are, and your physical mind. Okay. And what you're seeing when you close your eyes and you're opened up your third eye, they call it the third eye is you're actually seeing what's really there energetically. You're able to see the energy of it. It's not that there's a gland in there or anything that is, you're seeing it like a TV tube. You're actually picking up the signals of everything around you. It, and you're, what you're talking about frequency is every human being has a frequency. Every being in the universe has a frequency. You think in a frequency. It's like a fingerprint, okay? It's strictly you. When you feel low or depressed, you're dropping the volume on your ability to think out loud or to receive signal from somewhere else to help you. The most depressed people in the world are those that have dropped the volume so much in their thinking and frequency that they can't hear anything else. And that's a very dark place to be. Okay. So yeah, when, when I'm trying to, when I have to fit into society, for instance, you know, I go and, and stay with my daughter, you know, for a week and visit the grandchildren and stuff. Or when I, um, um, you know, I actually don't have a lot of social contact outside of social media um, yeah. because it's, it's very hard for me. I have to put myself back into the construct, back into a box, zip my mouth, uh, control, be, be there, go back to the way I used to be. And it's, uh -huh. I can do it for a short period of time, but not for very long. And if I have to do it, like when I'm, when I'm staying at my daughter's for a week, it actually makes me sick. And then when I come oh, home, then I can be, then I can be free again. Absolutely free. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, if you lock yourself up, you're not helping yourself at all. Breathe, just breathe. Let everything come in on yourself and smile. They don't know what's going on in here. But if you lock yourself up, you cannot transmit your thoughts to them at all. Okay. And the greatest gift you've got is your ability to do that. And if they're that closed mind, if they're that shut down, or they're that, you know, they're the ones that need to hear the, the truth, not you. Not no, 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 no. Not when it comes to my yeah. daughter and her life. No, she is a very strong-willed person. Did and she's made, made her own 
made her own decisions on how, what's real and what's not. And that's how it is when I stay there. And those are the terms that I you have to abide by. You don't have to physically say it to her. Just breathe. Just be. What, what you know is the truth be evolving in your own mind. Don't say anything to them because you're transmitting without speaking. Okay. If you lock yourself up in a ball, that's got to be the most anxiety providing situation. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. It makes me yeah. sick. Makes that's me why. Sick. Don't do it. Just be you. You don't yeah, have people to will pick up on your thoughts, even if it's not yeah. fully conscious. Cause like right. you say, we are all telepathic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you might actually see things change a little bit around them. If you bend their will, you're doing exactly what everybody on this planet has been taught to do. They're forcing you to do that. We see have to things? shine our light. We have to... yeah. so I have another question in right. which I like, because, you know, in my experience with UFO research, people who are on these craft, a lot of it is all about healing. And I know that pretty much every major researcher has healing. And people talk about implants as well. From everything I've researched and learned about implants, it has to do with healing. So here's a question I find pretty interesting. I would love to, to know if you've had any healing experiences because <laughs> ED is asking, have you ever woken up with any healing devices implanted in your body? or? And I would just add to that, you know, have you had any healings uh, at their hands or, you know what I mean, in any way? Or, or is it because what you do is all about healing? <laughs> um, I don't know. I have to think about that. I, I don't think I've ever woke up with a healing device implanted in my body. I, I don't think I have had, ha not that I'm aware of, no. Right. Um, as for healing goes, um, Part of my journey is to experience what a lot of people experience, and I have to experience that. And then I find my way out with the help, and then I write about it or, um, you know, create content to help other people. So it's kind of like um, I'm it's kind of like I experience it, I find my way out, and then I share with other people how I found my way out. And I'm not saying that other people find their way out the same way, but it'll give them um, um, a, a different perspective that they can then go and look for themselves. Because I think everyone needs to find their true her, uh, healing journey is within, mm -hmm. yep. right, is within. And, um, and so, no, I never had everything I have accomplished i have had to work for but i've always had help so right. you know i didn't get any like instant healing and or um don't have to wear glasses anymore or um no i had i had to and i primarily uh find my way out and it almost always comes down to what i eat it's and and because i'm so sensitive i can't eat what other people eat either i have to be very very careful on what I eat. So I don't fit into the construct at all anymore. Um, <laughs> um, not even, not even food. I wouldn't, I mean, I would have, I never go to restaurants. There's no point. I can make exactly what I need and want at home for, you know, a fraction of the price. And I got to yeah. put that money into my, uh, into my website and my social media so I can keep getting the, getting the message out. Right. So you're writing a book. How far along are you in this book? I'd say about, <laughs> about 70%. One of the problems I'm having is um, I'm using Microsoft Word and it keeps trying to grammar correct me. And it really upsets me and confuses me because I want to use my own creative license as I describe things that we don't have necessarily language for. So it's not going to come across necessarily the way... Uh, perfect grammar is supposed to be but it's even worse than that because it's like they want to dummy me down to very basic sentence structure and I don't get to use my creative ability and so I'm struggling with that all the time even the spell check can be annoying Have but you tried dragon pardon it's called dragon Looking no, up. I don't have good success with Dragon. I don't know if I don't talk right or what but when I've tried Dragon naturally speaking before and just talk into it. No, it doesn't. It, yeah, it, there's I so many like mistakes that I just get screwed up. The other thing, too, is uh, like I told you, I'm neurodivergent, but I also am recovering from a brain injury. And so it's very difficult for me to uh, what I think and how it comes out my mouth is not necessarily the same thing. And so, um, you know, when I'm typing, um, 
when I'm typing, um, sometimes it takes a fair amount of effort to get it to, to be, and I want it to be as close to my experience as possible. Do so my, dad did. My, dad, my dad was a neurodivergent. He was dyslexic. Okay. He couldn't uh, read something and get it. He had to read it into a tape recorder and then listen to it. Okay. But yeah, can, I'm, my reading skills are very, very, very poor too. Well, um, what it is is I don't generate the yeah. imagination images of the words. I look at the words and I have to literally okay. define what each word means in order for me to read. And then that takes all the joy. I just want to throw the book okay, out well, the window. A better platform. Don't do that. <laughs> so, tape recording but, system and talk into the system. You speak it and find somebody to trans, you know, transpose it or whatever, put it on the paper for you. And then you go back and you uh, you have a, a like a, a computer system that just reads it out. It reads the book after you've typed it in, and then you can hear what you've written and then make corrections as you go along. In other words, it's a little couple more steps, but you can speak into a tape recorder, have somebody put it on paper for you word for word, and then you go back and let a computer read it back to you so that you can see where you need to make small changes. I think you'd, you'd do really well doing that. Just, just keep at it. I know from having written. I'm just books, gonna keep keep at it. it. I'm gonna Don't just keep up. <laughs> I'm no. just gonna keep at keep at it. And um and um I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep at it. Yeah. And right. I'll get I'll get there. So I have um, a bunch of questions stacking up. So okay. Not... <laughs> Here's another one. And I know you mentioned orbs. So maybe Dolly could comment on this. I have my own uh, opinion about orbs. I think there can be spirits and ET as well. But Olivia asks, I would love to know what the orb is because I just had an experience in my hotel room at Contact in the Desert in Indian Wells, California. And all I could do is watch it drift from the TV to the door. And you, you said you've had orb experiences yeah. And you're like, what are they? <laughs> I haven't had any any for I haven't had any for probably a few years now, uh, which is interesting because I used to see them all the time. But what I think they are is <clears throat> okay, so we live in a three-dimensional uh reality. So we have what you call an X, Y, and Z axis. Axis, axis, A X I S, axis, right. axis, right? So if you go to a fourth dimensional you might have W, X, Y, and Z. Well, we don't have the W here. So I think the orbs are things that are um, that we're not seeing their true form. We're just seeing as if we dipped our toe into a lake, only our toe would be in the lake. We're only seeing that little tiny representation of what that is. And I think um, um, Lala Bright, I had her on my show not too long ago, and she thinks that it could be things like ancestors because um, or um, family members that have passed or friends or could be, you know, all kinds of different things. And that's how they um, make their presence known. That's what she says. But I think it sort of fits. My experience is that um, I've, I had to learn uh, while, while I was in training to be able to fly with the craft. OK, the pilot uh, knows all the coordinates. Um, we're trained to go somewhere and remember it exactly where it was. And I have an eidetic memory. I can remember every uh, marker. I don't even know how to explain that, but there's frequency and markers and transmitted uh, places that I can reach because I know the numbers to it. I know the frequency of it. And uh, if you ever knew what a monolith was, they're transponders. And there are beacons for us to go to places, and I can tag one and get there. Um, I, in this process of learning to join with the craft, the mind of the craft, you know, the being that's in the craft, I had to learn how to remote my consciousness out of my, without going OBE out of my body. I just remote my conscious mind into, it's, it's like an electromagnetic orb, giant ball, and it's, it's created this one, okay? And we both meet in it with our minds and we totally join minds and we communicate back and forth with one another. I become the ship, the ship comes to me. Um, in doing this, I learned the second thing that we do, and we used to call it spying. When we come to a place and we're looking for somebody, we remote out. The ship generally does it 
I can do it, but the ship will do it, the, the being in the craft. And when they do remote their mind out, you see it as a giant white orb. It's about this big, okay? And it's solid. It's not fluctuating or anything. It's a big, white, bright light, and it looks solid like a ball. And they come down, and they look around. They're spying to see if they can see what they need to see. They come back. Their consciousness comes back up to the craft, and that's what they do. It's a type of spying. I learned that I can do it, but I'm not a great big white orb. I'm not that developed. I come out as a blue orb, a little one, you know, about the size of a tennis ball. And uh, it's, um, I creeped myself out the first time I did it because I went by a mirror and I actually saw myself. I was like, holy cow, that's me. And then I had some friends actually say, come out, you know, remote view us, come out to where we are and we'll see if we can see you. And they did. They took pictures of it. You can see me as a blue ball. That is one way that ET uses orb tech. You know, it's just their mind remoting out. What you said, though, you're when you're free of your body, you're light. And if you're hanging around with your family or coming to visit them, sometimes people see you as a ball of light. OK, and it just depends on how developed you are at being energetic enough to be here. And I I, sometimes they can push out and try to look human to you. You know, you see you see what you would call a ghost or whatever, but that is another way that an orb can occur. And then there are natural orbs that are on this planet. It's a natural phenomenon. They're electrical, and you can see uh, ball lightning can be as small as a marble or as big as your house, and it, can, it rolls around, and it does things, and people sometimes see those things, and it's any type of size. It just depends on the amount of electricity involved. Um, big high tension wires can arc off into orbs also and just roll across the sky or they drop to the ground and they spiral around. Those are natural phen phenomena, but it's all light. It's all energy. Anyway, they, they have something in common with each other. That's what I was taught. That's what I learned how to do. Hmm, cool. So. Preston, you're muted. You're muted. Hold on, he's saying just a minute. He's got to figure it no. out. There you <laughs> Sorry. Go. Yeah. No, a lot of people do have orb experiences, and uh, there's all kinds of photography of orbs, which I'd recommend being very careful about because some of these are dust mites, I think. Uh, but yeah, orbs is a big thing in this field, and I think we're definitely searching for answers on it. So yeah, I appreciate you guys saying that. But I've got more questions from the chat, and here is one from Robert Allen Yaffe, who has a very kind of interesting question. What kinds of these experiences enhanced your ascension the most? <laughs> that's, that's a big one to unpack. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how you can. Or if I, think, I think, well, as I, as I mentioned before, I, I got that download and I created the nine steps to quantum health transformation. So what that program does is it helps you um, it helps you to create a physical environment. I call it the body temple. And so the body temple needs to have certain elements in order for us to have um, uh, um, a, a ascension or contact or things like that. Now, I know there are people, I know people have terrible diet and they, they, they have no problem making spiritual contact. I can't speak for them. I can only speak for me. So in the nine steps of quantum health transformation, um, and it, by the way, you do step nine first and step one last. So step nine, eight, and seven are all about opening your mind. So step nine is, is not only about opening your mind and seeing things for, at, in a more complex way. So instead of up or down, north or south, black or white, you know, that's bullshit. All, everything else is in the middle between those two and learning to recognize it. But also um, doing um, shadow work, where we where we um, get in touch with the less likable aspects of ourselves. Because until we have both our light and our shadow working together, we're only operating like trying to fly with only one wing. We're missing half that information. Um, step eight is all about technologies like grounding and different things like even affirmations that can help us. Those all help raise our, our frequency and open our mind. Um, then the next step is male-female integration. That's the yin-yang. Left side of our body's female, the right 
side is male. We need to learn how to integrate those energies, not run from them because we think we have to be gender specific. I'm not going to touch that topic. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then the middle three, uh, the middle three uh, lessons, which is step um, six, five, and four is detoxification. Yeah. external detoxification internal what is real food what isn't because 90 percent of what's sold in the supermarket is not real food nothing shuts you down your health and your natural ability to ascend than garbage that 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 we think is food and it's not well same as our cleaning products and our personal care products and all of that needs to be looked at and um, and then also we need to learn how to detox emotionally because all of our emotions are given to us for a reason and we have a right. It's our birthright to have and express all of our emotions and we learn how to express them in appropriate ways. And then we need to detoxify from the construct. And until we do that, we're still running under this programming that's undermining our ascension process. Then the last three steps, so first, you open your mind, then you detoxify your body and, and everything else, and then you're ready to start really getting somewhere. And then the last three steps are things like how, how to supercharge your manifestations, how to make them work for you. Some people are always trying to manifest something and then they give up and they start to manifest something else and they end up with this energetic big mess. Uh, they never get focused. They don't know what they're doing. Um, also, how to create your own spiritual framework that you can hang everything on so if you're into fairies great if you're into angels or if you're catholic none it doesn't matter a spiritual framework is something that you create for yourself that's ideally suited to yourself and within that framework we start to make contact and then the very last step is spiritual exercises which really just teach you how to love what is love how can we express love and that has to start with loving ourselves first and most people do not know how to love themselves so and you know that program is absolutely free and it's for humankind those who want to use it now it's not the only way it's a way so what i recommend at the beginning of each video or um you know piece of information is that um people keep an open mind take the information in and then use it as a jumping off point to go off and do something completely different that achieves the same goals. You know, you don't have to be a vegan. You don't have to be a meditarian. You don't have to be on any specific. You just need to know what's real food. What can our bodies use, you know, and things like that. So that's sort of how, yes, this, this, these experiences have helped me in my ascension. And, and the more I do that, the be, the more contact and easier it is. I have a giant question. Do Canadians fluoride, fluoride their water fluoridate? Oh, God, yeah. Not just fluoride and chlorine. They also put in all kinds of other things. Not to mention they never filter out all the pharmaceuticals that people are peeing out and pooping out and dumping their pills down the toilet. That's never filtered out. All the hormones all the uh, waste from all the oil and gas and the farming. So it's and not the just the food you eat, it's also the water you drink. Oh, right? absolutely, absolutely. I, I buy spring water. I only drink spring water. Right. All absolutely. Right. Well, I have another question. I'm hoping to get through a bunch of these because we only have like 15, 20 minutes. Sorry, no, they allow you some... allow us humans to get on the ship. Not Never going to happen. Um, but what if you reach you know, go through the whole ascension process. Some people. If you, if you do the work so that you're, so if, if we do the work, and I'm not saying you got to be perfect because I sure as a heck I'm not perfect. But when we're really trying to reach that next level of our evolution, then, then they can work with us. But right. until then, can you imagine if they just, took all the people what you know out looting and fires and this and that and they, they're gonna I put know. them on the big ship i don't think so I love you. control I love you. You, have, you have cajones for telling the truth about that, that is you know if true. we're not if we're not thinking about well i'm not doing this to be popular i'm trying to no, help people you That's know right. we don't have any control over our right. thinking and we can't be present we can't do it what the hell is going to happen if you get a bunch of these people up onto the big ship? 
It's going to be taking infections. And that's why I've been told that we on earth are quarantined. So um, we're quarantined until we can learn how to behave ourselves. And, and, and so I guess, I don't know if we're limited to our solar system or if it's a pretty small area compared to what, what's out there. Right. So, so no, I'm sorry. I hate to tell you this, but oh God, it's good news. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen to what they say. This is the absolute message from ET. Stop being a slave. Wake up, learn to use your abilities, detox your body Detox your mind. Get away from being told everything, what to do. No negativity. Turn the TV off. Quit listening to them jibber-jabber because you're not listening if you do that. When you open your mind, you are listening to the universe talk at that point. ET can get through to you that way. And once you start that conversation, you're on your way. But that is their absolute message. Wake up. And, yeah. you know. Well, here's a question which kind of speaks to that because here on earth we have money and Robert Allen Yaffe is asking, do they have some form of money? No. Which trade or bargain? Absolutely. No, 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 no. There's no concept of, of money. There's more than enough of everything. Like everything at the end of the day, you just, whether if you're finished eating it, whether it's your clothes, you're wearing whatever, it all goes into like a shoot. Everything gets rendered down. They've got, a, it's like, if you can imagine, it's kind of like the ship's digestive system. Everything gets broken down. They've got bugs and stuff that live in there, and that's their job, and they're happy as can be. That's their environment. They break everything down. Then everything gets kind of 3D, what we would consider like 3D printed, fresh every, every day, and there's more than enough. But there is a lot of trade because it's a cultural thing. It's a social, yes. cultural thing. If you, you can make they can, and everybody loves each other. If, if someone really wanted my hat, I would just give them my hat. I can have a new hat. They can go make their own hat. Like, yeah, no greed. No, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Nothing. Money is a slaver's tool. Yeah. Instead of the whip, they use, they goad you with money. They tell you, oh, you can buy this. And they make all the pretties for you to try to go and grab. And yeah. it takes all your attention away from the fact that you're now under their control. No money. Yeah, money is the whip, but they, yeah, no, nothing like that. Right. Yeah, that would, that's cool. a ridiculous, it would be a ridiculous concept right. to them. Right. So here is a related question to all this, uh, which you've already kind of answered, and Dolly has certainly talked about this. <laughs> Scarlet Fire is asking, will they save the current earth from the cabal taking it over? No, I don't think no, so. No, awesome. because we can do this ourselves. If you have a child and you do everything for them and they never have to learn anything, what kind of, a, what's that child going to grow up to be? Basically a useless adult, right? Right. So the same thing we with us. We not only created this problem for ourselves, we, we allow it. it by not doing anything about it. And so, we can yeah. fix it. And it's not even that hard. It's not even that hard to fix it. You just change yourself, you become the change you want to see in the world. And it catches on. It's contagious. Right. And some people won't change. And I don't know what to say about them, but we can do this. We've got this. And they we're, know we've we're got all it. immortals. So, you know, we, we might right. take us a million years to learn, but one of these days we'll incarnate and learn it. I I have hope. I'm I'm an optimist. <laughs> some yeah. people may eventually devolve and that's their decision. Yeah. I feel like I progress will tell you is this. I will tell you this, Karen, I want you to hear what I say, okay? There's coming a time in the future where they're hoping this is not a proven thing because we have to prove it, where enough of us evolve, enough of us wake up, enough of us join together to be ready if they come. And when they come, they're going to know who you are because you oh, yeah. communicate with them. They'll know That's by our frequency. Time. Right. They'll know by our frequency. And they will start rescuing people at that point. If you're ready for them, they'll rescue you at some point, and it is coming. It's in the future. They are not going to teach. They are not going to stop everybody from doing bad things. They're not going to tell the governments you're out of line. Stop it now. They're not going to remove the nukes. They're not going to do any of that. We have to do it ourselves. Yep. And if you have any hope of wanting to be with them at all in this lifetime and in this iteration of this physical body you're in, you need to start working now. It's important. 
So. You know, I, I get so many people who say, Karen, I want to be able to do what you do. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And then when I say, well, take a look at your diet, take a look at, you know, what you're thinking. Oh, no, I don't want to do all that. I just want to be able to do what you do. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, it's work. You can't you can't be wise until you can wear and operate and employ what you learn. OK, and learning is a chore. It's a job. It, I mean, heck, you worked a long time when you were a baby to learn how to walk. You worked a long time to learn how to read and write. You worked a long time to get enough education to get a job. These are all not easy things that you can do. You have the ability, everybody does. And using your mind and taking care of your body, which is a temple, you're exactly right. This is, this is what we should do. And yes, it's hard work. But, you know, cushy lifestyles teach people to think everything needs to be handed to them. And it's not there's coming a day where you might regret not doing anything in your life to help yourself. So think about that. So yeah, don't wait too long guys. Get on it. Really become the change you want to see in the world. The other thing too, is you probably all heard about the whole hundredth monkey thing, you know, yeah. where, you know, yeah. we don't need 51, 52% of the world to wake up to change. No, we only need something like, I don't know, less than 10%. Once 10% is woke up and we're getting, we're getting there whammo everything is going to change and then basically it's going to be like the little dog on the wizard of oz that pulls back the curtain and we're going to see who's running things and it's just all a big fake 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 yep. yeah i know so i see in chat some of you guys came in late so and you want to catch up but uh we'll just have to watch from the beginning watch but, three yeah we're, we're, we're talking with karen holton she's a contactee yeah. and she's talking about her experiences yeah but here, I, I, Go quick because we have a lot of questions. I know. <laughs> the one thing I want to emphasize here is that ETs, all of them throughout our universe, are autonomous beings. If you're highly evolved, you understand that we're each of us responsible for ourselves and what we do and what we say and how we act. All of us here are autonomous beings as well. And that makes us responsible for what we do, what we say, and how we act. And they are not going to take that autonomy away from us. It's the greatest lesson you learn. And you have to make choices. You're either going to leave this place not okay, or you're going to leave this place great and happy. And however you choose to leave this place is totally up to us. That's the autonomy. You can decide to just hang out and do nothing and yeah, okay. But there are those who are going to choose another way, and they will. And we all have the right to choose. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, here's a question about the ship, and this came in at like 10 o'clock, so that's how far behind we are in the questions. Oh. <laughs> no, here's from Robert Allen Yaffe, who's asking all kinds of wonderful questions. How does the ship provide the needed environment for the different species on board? Well, first of all, we're all one species. We're just different races. So from Earth, we're humans. We are, from the human, yeah. we are yeah. of the hu yeah. human race. OK, and so we're not different species, so we're not going to have that much difference. But there is some differences. And as I, you may have missed earlier when I was talking about the healing pods, that's the purpose of the healing pods, to condition us all so that we can be in a more neutral environment on the big ship. Right. Every, every ethnicity of ET, and we're all humanoid, we all have DNA. Everything has DNA. If you're alive and living, you have DNA, and that's from the plants all the way up to us and above. And uh, it is uh, imperative for people to stop thinking of themselves as a species. A species is the only description that somebody on this planet used one day to describe the difference between us bipedal walking human beings and a dog. A dog, they say, is a different species. Um, ET doesn't see it that way, but that's how we've been taught. It's incorrect. Absolutely no. It's a misnomer. Yeah, that's now, what I love, Karen, about you saying, oh, they're just people. I call right. them people because that's they what they are. That's what we all are. Some of us have great big lungs and can breathe in heavy amounts of air under huge, heavy gravity. Some places have very little gravity, and our great big lungs are not going to do as well there, and we have to condition to it. We have to get used to doing that. We also have to get used to the fact that the temperature is different. We have to acclimate. There's a lot of acclimating going on, and that's yeah. why the grounding. It takes a little while for us to acclimate to those environments, and it's a process. You're correct. So, All right. Here's a quick question from, well, I hope it's quick because I want to get through. When DGK is asking about the no violence bit. Does that mean they won't defend themselves from wild fauna or micro 
meteors? Well, I assume, yes, they defend themselves from Protect is the word. Defend is not a word. Nor be in a situation where they wouldn't be, you know, around wild animals and stuff like that. Um, the other thing too is, uh, like, a lot of people don't get it that are the animal are the animals, even our pets. They have the full range of emotions. They love their young. They 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 hurt. They feel hungry. They get their feelings hurt, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, is we can have like a non-verbal, almost a psychic connection with our pets. Well, well, when people resettle onto new planets and stuff, they can do the, a similar thing with the animals. So it's not the natural way for, for you know, to be chased around by tigers and stuff, because literally the tigers on earth would chase humans because they've probably been abused by humans. Like, like this is a completely a uh, different environment. It's like a total fresh start. So I don't know about any, I've never heard of anyone having to defend themselves from asteroids or, um, you know, have to have weapons and have to fight. Um, they're all very physically fit, but none of them work out. It's just the nat their natural way of being, you know, right. just regular body movement. All yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Sex and orgasm does exist. And you're going to have to wait for the book because I got quite a bit to say about all that. It's true. <laughs> said it's in the first yeah. hundred years that procreation yeah. but there's there's sex without sex too like for instance they have the ability um to basically throw the energy at another person and give them an orgasm energetically there's a way of going mind to mind and producing an orgasm or very similar to an orgasm also the heart chakra heart to heart humans could do this if right. we were sexually mature which we're not and so there's that. And then there is, of course, good old fashioned intercourse, which is the preferred way for people to make babies, no matter yeah. at least all the beings that I met. And um, so and then I did have a very unusual experience with an aquatic being humanoid. But I, that you got to read for the book. OK. All right. Well, Dolly talks in her experiences about how the ship gave her a name, which she couldn't pronounce. So she calls him Talata. Um, Robert Allen Yaffe is asking, did the ship have a name? Yeah, Talara. And I nope. say Talara because I roll my R's. I'm Swedish. Uh, and I speak Swedish first, so I'm in my head Swedish all the time. Uh, but yeah, his name is really long, and it's one little component of his name that I could pronounce. So that's what I call him. Um, and it's only because I requested it. He doesn't really have a name, but that's what he thinks of himself as. And it's a description of himself. You know, there is one other name that I know of, and I'm going to say it out loud to everybody. Um, in, or, in, in, or, in the constellation of Orion, there is a home world for the tall grays. This is not the name of the world. It's how they feel about it. Everything mm -hmm. is feelings. And they call it Anneomach. And it's just the home of the people. That's what that means, Anneomach. And uh, that's how they refer to it. And they won't tell that to just anybody like I just did you, but that's how they refer to it. It is a feeling. It is you're one of the people. That's why the people here learn that from them. We are the people. They all are the people. So that's it. But when, I, when I'm there, they don't call me Karen either. They call me impulsive, joyful, <laughs> yeah. human. Yeah. So it's right. not, they don't use the words, but the concepts of impulsive, I'm impulsive, joyful, helper, human, because I always want to get involved in everything. Uh, that's roughly translated what they call me. Um, but um, the other yeah. thing too is, is besides using telepathy, there is some gesturing and depending on the being, some gesture more than others. But um, it, it really doesn't take long before you um, before you, you get the knack of it. There are assistive technologies that you can use. I didn't want to use them. I wanted to learn how to do it. Oh, wow. All right, we only have time for just a few more questions because I want to give you some time, Karen, to talk about all the wonderful things you are offering people. But here's an important one, I think, coming from Janice Conant. Uh, ever since Karen started talking about, let me see, ever since Karen started talking, I've been experiencing a different smell around me, not floral or negative odor ever experienced before. Karen, have you experienced different smells while there? What you actually talked about already. 
Um, yeah, but the other thing too is some some beings have very sensitive smell and some not so much. And we all have a, have our own natural odors and stuff. So I just want to talk a little bit about the ship's respiratory system, which is like a ventilation system. And so there's something, I don't know what it is, but it comes out little poofs. It's kind of like dust and it sort of cleans everything and then gets sucked back into the system. So it's actually part of the ship's respiratory system. And so you don't notice a lot of odors, but if you go up to some of these plants and you just bury your face and have a good smell, you can absolutely smell them, um, you know, but um, on a spiritual context, though, this is a little bit different here on earth. If I'm making spiritual contact, sometimes I can sense smells. I definitely pick it up in my olfactory system. Um, and I don't think I'm smelling a being. It's just a smell seems to be associated with the energetic experience of making contact. You want to know what I learned from the tall grays? This is crazy, but it's true. Um, they smell each other. That's how they greet. They put foreheads together and they inhale each other. And everybody has their own smell and they know who you are by your smell. And human mothers, it was brought to my attention when I had a baby. Um, I was taught to catch the smell of my baby, that it's important for me to know what my baby smells like. I could pick her out of anywhere. And no. I did. it. And I learned also that human beings, us, are very related to the tall race and that it's one of the things that we do do. And it's very important to human beings to use their smell. Now, here's the other one. If you have a relative who passes and they're coming around you, you're going to smell them because yes. you learn. That's that. This is that person. And you associate it instantly with that person trying to smell. Yes. Yep. yep. All right. Well, we're, we're going to have to end it here. I wish I could get to more questions. Just this last one. Yes or no. Karen and Dolly, do you consider yourselves starseeds and lightworkers? Yes no. Or no. <laughs> um, I would say no. I just I don't have I don't have a title. I don't represent those beings in any way. I'm not their grand poobah. I'm not their spokesperson. I'm nobody special. Right. I'm just I'm just Karen. Just trying to deliver a message. That's it. Yeah, just trying All to right. get it right. That's it. Well, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna have to pretty much stop here. I just want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the products and services you offer in a minute or so. Can you? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so I host two main podcasts. One of them is the Quantum Guide Show. And I interview people who have woke up, realized the world is not what they thought it was. And then they get through the shock and awe of it all. And then they put themselves to good purpose. So they might be doing, you know, what Dolly does or, or what Preston does, or they might be artists or musicians, or they might be researchers. And these people... Um, these people um, then are, are doing something good. And so I invite them on my show. Besides, it's just the greatest way to meet the most amazing people and make the bestest kind of friends, uh, you know, and they could live anywhere in the world. So there's that show. And uh, then there is Aliens and Angels. And that is hosted by me. And it's more informal discussion, talking to other people who, who are experiencers, whether it's aliens or angels or something in that genre. Oh, there's one of my organ generators. So um, in order for me to do what I'm doing, I need some kind of an income. And so what I did is I created, I didn't make them, a friend of mine made them for me, but I designed them and created uh, what I wanted. And he made them for me. And I have these organ generators and I know people can go on Etsy and get probably organ generators for two bucks each, but they're not the same thing. These have been very carefully infused and entangled in, in amazing ways. I don't have time to really get into how they work or anything like that. But if you're interested in organ generators, I have had the most amazing testimonials from people when they get one of my organ generators. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have unexpected. I'm going to have to cut you off because I don't want to go over our time. Okay, I'm yeah. done. Do this again, Karen. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you for having me on the show. And thank you, everybody. I love you all. So, Dolly, you want to close us out? Yep. Got one you minute. Yes. Listening to the Light Gate, and we are on United Public Radio Network, coming from the beautiful city of New Orleans on 107.7 FM and the United Paranormal. Paranormal Network at 105.3 FM. We love you and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, guys.